Hello, welcome everybody to this edition of Hardman Talks. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Alistair Haynes, who's the Chief Executive of Aquis PLC. Aquis is a quoted company, quoted on the London Stock Exchange, but it also has its own exchange, the Aquis Stock Exchange, and that's what we're going to focus on today. So uh, welcome, Alistair. Great to be here, Keith. Thanks. Okay, so let's get stuck in. So those who uh, haven't looked at Aquis before might have heard of some of its precedents. So it used to be called NEX. I think it's been called Plus Markets, various other things. So the first question I guess we ought to answer is, why didn't NEX and all the other iterations of the same exchange not work? Well, I think if somebody once said to me when we first bought the next exchange, fifth time lucky isn't an easy sell. And, and actually there's been four attempts. There's been there's been the next exchange, there's been ISDX, there was plus markets and OPEX. And you're absolutely right. None of these markets succeeded in, in their objective. And I think pr- the prime reason for that is that they were trying to compete with AIM and trying to do something and become AIM cheaper. I don't believe that's the way to go forward here. They never reached the standards that was required for institutions to invest. They never managed to connect the retail market to their market, which is, I believe, absolutely critical. Um, and I think that they, they just didn't ever really get the momentum that's necessary. Now, I think things have changed very dramatically. Um, and I think timing plays a very important part. I think we're very fortunate to be at a time that is critical for companies to raise capital. There's a paradigm shift that's gone on here. And if you look at things, I think the way that stock exchanges have existed in the past is changing forever. And the way I say that, the reason I say that is that the years post-war, baby boomer years, buying equities was always seen as much of a privilege. It was very much the pinstripe suit gentleman in some club, uh, average age 50 plus who would have some stockbroker and they would go off and they would buy shares in the London Stock Exchange or on the London Stock Exchange. Well, you know, today things are very different. We have 3 billion people in the world who they game electronically, digitally. They communicate digitally. They shop digitally. They entertain themselves with music and, you know, watching movies digitally. And you know what? They're going to invest digitally. They're going to create their wealth digitally. And that's why things have changed in the Generation X, Generation Y, the millennials. And I think what we're trying to do here at Aquis is become the exchange for those people who are looking at the new economy, looking at the digitalization that's going on here. And there's a tremendous opportunity to do that. If you look at what NASDAQ did in the 80s and 90s, you know, go back 30, 40 years ago, they were, you know, the United States had a very good gold standard market in the New York Stock Exchange. And yet along comes this exchange that started to price things, price these new businesses that nobody really understood called tech. And of course, yes, there was a bubble. And yes, people said some of these things wouldn't work in the same way as they talk about digitalization today. But out of it came companies like Microsoft and Facebook and Google and all sorts of huge successes. Now, I think the world is ready and needs, and the United Kingdom definitely post-Brexit, needs a venue which actually can be the new NASDAQ of Europe. And that is exactly where Equus is positioning itself. It is not trying to compete with AIM or the standard market and do things cheaper. It is literally being a part of this paradigm shift. Uh, I can tell the, the passion coming through there uh, very clearly. But so, so what has changed now that Aquis is in charge? Well, I think the the very first thing we did is is consulted with the market. And that's important because you need to understand why people are not happy with the current status quo. And and I've often said this, and and some of your viewers might have heard me say this before, but do you know companies are very like children? They start small, they grow, and they mature. And at all times of their life, you're never quite certain when they need money, just like one's children. And exactly what happens here is the problem with the United Kingdom is that we've ended up with a one size fits all, a very sort of prescriptive regulatory. And when companies come to market, it tends to be slow, it tends to be expensive. And often people look at different avenues to go to raise capital because we don't have this proportionality and we don't have this appropriateness. We all know that companies that have a 10 million pound market cap trade differently, act differently than those companies that say have a 200, 300 million pound market cap which are very different to those that are two or three billion. So the first thing we've done in Aquis is we've segmented markets to make very clear rules so that there is the proportionate 
and appropriate mechanisms for raising capital if you're sub 10 million market cap. And again, and we call that the access market, and we have a clear set of rules for that. We then have the apex market for those companies that are really in their growth phase. So the access market is like having a primary school. It's nothing shameful of being at a primary school. You're learning to be a public company. It's a very important stage, very important stage for the education of children. Then when you're in the apex market, that's like that's going to your secondary school, your high school. Um, and that really is where you're learning everything that you start to need to know for the rest of your life. And that's where we'll see growth. That's where we'll expect our average market cap in the 21 companies that currently sit on our apex is around about 80 million. And we think that many of those companies will end up being companies that go on to seven, 800 million. And then from there, you go on to the main market. So you have a very, very sort of, um, just like on a sc schools, you go from primary to secondary to university, and you have this clear path as a company. And at each phase, you have a different set of rules, a different form of regulation, and a different trading mechanism that becomes appropriate because it is essential that each of these companies, as they're raising capital, also get liquidity. So uh, I guess we, we, we've got to answer the question that uh, you sort of alluded to, which is, what is the difference then between AIM uh, and, uh, and the Aquas Exchange? Well, I think if we look at access, which is our you know, the early stage market there, the rules have, uh, you know, you have an admissions document to, to, uh, to come to market, very similar to AIM. Uh, you don't need to sign to up to a corporate governance code, which is, which is different to AIM. But as you move on to our apex market, the first difference I would say to AIM is our standards are higher. And that's really important when you get institutions wanting to invest, because in order to come to our apex market, you need a growth prospectus. Now, what is a growth prospectus? Well, we did one a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, for the first ever company to go onto an exchange in Europe using a growth prospectus. And it's a recognized prospectus. It is shorter. So Samarkand was that company. Uh, the prospectus was 150 pages long. I've seen risk disclosure statements in prospectuses that are longer than 150 pages long. So by having something that is shorter, something that is templated, but something that is approved by the UK listings authority. So it has this status above that of an admissions document. So you can get here faster, quicker, cheaper, more efficiently, more templated, more technology, and the, 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 the more technology use in order to get the, the, this growth prospectus. And why is this useful? Well, the standard is higher, but also retail can be involved. In certain cases, you can have qualified investors. In others, you could have retail investors, the full retail community. And getting retail involved at the early stage at the IPO is a really important thing to do. You don't want just retail. You want a mixture between the institutions, family offices, international investors, and retail. And it was said recently, the three chief executives of Interactive Investor, Hargreaves, Lansdowne, and AJ Bell were talking about how many, how few, how few chances there had been over the last four or five years for retail investors to actually participate in an IPO. And I think that should change. And Aquis is definitely looking for that. So the first thing is the growth prospectus. The second thing is liquidity. We've done a deal with six of the major market makers in the United Kingdom. So the people like Peel Hunt, Shaw Capital, Winterflood, Stiefel, Canaccord, Libram, etc. They've all signed up to a warrant scheme. Now, what that means is we will actually issue warrants in the Equus stock exchange business up to an amount of 19.9% going back to the days where market makers could also be part owners of a stock exchange. And in return, we want a commitment for them to have narrower spreads and provide that capital, competing capital, so that we get tighter spreads. And for the retail market, those spreads are approximately 5% maximum wide. Now, what we've seen already since we've introduced that on January the 4th is a tightening of spreads by over 50% and by a turnover increase by more than 700%. So again, one doesn't need to work out that if you narrow spreads, provide capital, get competing capital providers there, out there, you can get more liquidity. So the second thing I would say is not only do you get a higher standard, not only do you get retail involved at the early stage, but the retail also have liquidity. I'm fed up with seeing stock price spreads of 10, 20% wide. I don't think that's good for retail. You don't pay stamp duty on an Aquist because it's a growth market, the same as you don't on AIM. But why avoid 
you know, 50 basis points of, of, of stamp duty when the spread's 10 or 20 percent wide. That's not going to attract retail investors at all. We're looking to change that. The third thing is we ban short selling while you're in the apex market. We think a huge number of investors suffer because people come along and they will short sell a stock, particularly stocks that are in less liquid. And we know for a fact that these growth stocks are always going to be less liquid than a FTSE stock or FTSE 250. And what happens is these stocks lose their value, the price falls, it's much harder for them to raise capital, the cost of capital in effect goes up, their staff leave, and quite often the company will go bust. That means the United Kingdom has lost a great company, the entrepreneur has not achieved what they wanted to do, although it could have been a great company, and the long-term early investor, the retail investor, has lost out. So we're here to protect those people. And we are proud to protect those people. And that differentiates us completely from what something like AIM is doing. So if you look at it, you've got retail investors, you've got a higher standard, you've got liquidity through a market making scheme, you've got protection through short selling. And the other thing we've done is we don't have nomads. We don't think the nomad structure, we think that creates a sort of Chinese whisper type effect, which sometimes means that companies won't be able to. You can't, you know, as, as an AIM stock ourselves, we can't have a conversation with the AIM regulator. We have to go through the nomad. We don't think that's right. We think that all companies should have a conversation with their stock exchange, as well as with their advisors and brokers. We're not taking that ray away from the advisor. We're absolutely insisting that's part of it. And you get all of that because it's templated, because we're using technology, because we've got our technology. And by the way, Aquis itself, Aquis Exchange PLC, we are the largest liquidity provider in European stocks, in the top 1,700 stocks in Europe, amongst any exchange. We're the seventh largest exchange by turnover. So we know a little bit about the provision of liquidity and how to create and boost markets. So you get all of this with the Aquis Stock Exchange if you're an issuer probably for around about 50% of what it would cost to go to the London Stock Exchange if you're an access stock, and probably 25% cheaper. But as I said at the very beginning about NEX or PLUS, this is not about price. What you're getting is a new economy exchange, a digitalized exchange that offers considerably more at a higher standard, but for less. And that, I think, is how we sell our business. Uh, Alistair, you, you uh, dropped in the word institutions uh, in, in that answer, and uh, I think it would probably not be unfair to say that there was virtually no institutional interest in NEX before. Um, so has it really changed? Are there institutions involved in it now? I, I think the answer is you, you, your, your, your viewers should go out there and ask the institutions themselves. Uh, we did know in the last few listings we've done, we've seen some of them have over 25 institutions involved. Uh, if you, people go onto our web page, they'll see a list of names, which will companies that will actually invest, institutions that will invest in Aquis Stock Exchange stocks. The key here, and this we learned in the consultation process, is that as companies move into Apex, which is the higher of the growth market, um, they need to have a corporate governance code. And corporate governance code is simply the single most important factor outside of whether the company itself is an interesting investment for a portfolio for an institution. I think the fact we've raised the standards and the fact that we have that liquidity for people to be able to trade, and it's critical to get the retail investor there to provide that liquidity for the asset managers, then we have asset managers wanting to invest in our stocks. And, you know, if you look at the last one, we, you know, 35 million pounds was raised NFT investments. We've just seen somebody announce today, Pluto, uh, which has looked to raise, it's just raised $40 million. We saw Samarkand with 17 million pounds, but pretty much raised more than hundred million or around hundred million pounds in the last few months since we've really got going. And we have more than 50 companies coming to our marketplace. I think people see the, the benefit, and I think institutions in particular, see the benefit of having a NASDAQ in Europe, which is the place where people can go to get the higher premiums, to get the listings they want. If you look at most tech companies, they don't come to London. They disappear off to, to, to New York. And everybody seems to have run around and go, well, why isn't the London Stock Exchange? Well, it needs competition in order to do that. And that's why we're here. And I think the institutions back us. 
And I think, you know, if people go out there, not every institution, I'll be absolutely honest and say, you know, just like, like the Industrial Revolution, there were still people who bought cart horses, still wanted to go to blacksmiths and still believed in you know, that the combustion engine was never going to uh, take off. Well, yes, you're always going to get the doubting Thomases, but these people will change. They'll change over time. They'll see what we're doing. And I think uh, they, you know, they'll learn their lessons fast. OK, so let's finish off by talking about uh, retail investor a little bit more. So you talked about some of the advantages uh, in terms of uh, you know, lower spreads, liquidity, et cetera, no shorting. Um, but what sort, of, uh, what sort of things can retail investors get involved in through, uh, uh, through Aquas that perhaps they haven't got exposure to elsewhere? What, what are, are there going to be well, particular focuses? Let, let's be perfectly honest here. You know, if, if public markets are going to work, we have to get the public back into public markets. So, so do not underestimate how important the retail are here. And I'm a firm believer and we're positioning ourselves to make certain we have retail and institution. What is the retail benefit on? We've got some great companies. You know, there are 21 companies just sitting in Apex. We've got 70 companies sitting in Access. There's some really exciting growth companies. We've seen people like KR1 go from 20 million pounds market cap. They, 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 they're they now around sort of 200 million market cap. We've lots of very, very exciting business. Salnox is a business that, you know, we're looking at ESG businesses out there. They have a product that you can put into every diesel car, or every petrol car in the world. They've got the mandate for it and actually to reduce carbon emissions. Now, you know, that I think, the retail market should be excited in. If we look at NFT, we look at um, blockchain investments, we look at e Samarkand, an e-commerce business, and we still have our traditional really good growth businesses, the Shepherd Neems, the Chapel Downs. You know, there are lots of very interesting companies that the retail market has not had access. And partly to blame because the AJ Bells or the interactive investors or the Barclays have never been able to connect. Well, they are connected now. And that, I think, is really important. Only Hargreaves Lansdowne is the one that hasn't connected to us yet. And they will. They must. Because if people, if they don't, they're going to change their accounts and people will move. Because we live in this fluid world where people can now change. So the key for us was make certain that the retail market are properly connected with enough information so they can take advantage of the incredible growth stocks that we have and the many that we're about to bring on board. So to clarify that, uh, Alistair, so by connect, what you mean is before, if you were, if you had an account, an uh, interactive investor or whatever, you couldn't deal on any X, whereas now you can deal in Aquas. Absolutely right. I mean, you know, you, you'd phone up and, and occasionally they, they might go to a desk, they charge you £50 a ticket or whatever it is. If you had to do it over the phone, you weren't necessarily going to get a great price. I mean, it was, it was in a, you know, it was never going to work. You could see it was never going to work. Now, we have shown these people, we've pushed these people, there's been big demand. We know very well that ShareSock survey that we worked with, 82% of people said they wanted access to all growth stocks, not just London Stock Exchange growth stocks, all growth stocks. And, you know, if you don't have access today, you're missing out on great opportunities. And as we started the conversation with this paradigm shift, it is the new generation who are going to do that research, they're going to get that information, they're going to get it on their smartphone and computers, and they're going to digitally communicate to the exchanges so that they can trade. And we have to position ourselves as an exchange of the future to be able to cope with that change that's going to happen. Alistair, thank you for uh, sparing the time today. That was a really interesting interview. Uh, and thank you to our viewers for, uh, for joining us. Uh, and I'd like to encourage them to like and subscribe uh, on, uh, on YouTube. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.